All right, so what we're gonna do now is uh, try out the Gram-Schmidt process that we just talked about um, on a basis for R3. So uh, here we're given a basis for R3. We're told that it's a basis, we don't need to verify it, but we, we do in fact need this to be a basis for the Gram-Schmidt process to work. Um, so the process is going to, uh, we, we wanna do the full thing where we turn this into an orthonormal basis which means once we get it in the form of an orthogonal basis, we will normalize um, all of the vectors that we get as a final step. So uh, to start with, um, step one is to define V1 to be the first vector in the set. Now in um, the way that we outlined the steps for the Gram-Schmidt process, I would be calling this U1, U2, and U3. So the first step is to define V1 to be U1 or in this case, two, zero, one. That's your freebie, right? You get that one um, automatically. Then the next step, V2 is supposed to be um, U2, so the second uh, basis vector here, one, zero, three, minus the inner product of U2 with V1. And again, even though it's not stated here, we're assuming that we're uh, working with a standard inner product. That's, that's fairly typical. If an inner product, if you're working in an inner product space and you're not told what the inner product is, you can generally assume that it's whatever the standard inner product for that space would normally be. It's the dot product in this case. So um, we want the dot product of uh, U2 with V1. So that's going to be 1, 0, Three, that's u2 dotted with v1 which we stated up there was two zero one over now the next thing that we're going to need here is the uh, magnitude of v1 squared so notice here the magnitude of v1 squared the purpose of uh, the second power normally when you evaluate a magnitude or a norm I, I, sorry, I should be calling it a norm. When you evaluate a norm of a vector in Rn with a dot product, it's the square root of something. And this square here is just gonna do away with the square root. So it's actually two squared plus one squared, which is five. That's gonna be what we divide by right here. That's a scalar at the end of all that. And that's gonna get multiplied to uh, the vector V1 that we came up with up here. So that's gonna be Two zero one. Okay, this gives me one zero three minus this dot product up here uh, it becomes two plus three. It's five, so I end up with five over five, which is one. Um, one times the vector two zero one is just the vector two zero one. So after all this, I end up with negative one zero two. That's v two right there. Okay, now we need V3. Well, one of the things I'm gonna need before I can do V3 um, is the norm of V2. It's gonna show up in that process, but notice the norm here, more specifically the norm squared, will also be five. You can compute that manually. It's just negative one squared plus two squared. Okay, so V3 is going to be equal to u3, which is the last vector in my basis up here, uh, negative 1, 1, 0, minus, um, now we need the dot product of the same vector, u3, with v1, so negative 1, 1, 0, dotted with 2, 0, 1, divided by the norm of v1 squared, which we know is 5, and this is time being multiplied to the vector v1. Then we have to subtract another term. Um, this term is going to look like u3 dotted with v2. So we're going to have negative 1, 1, 0 dotted with what we just found up here to be v2. Negative 1, 0, 2 over the, ma uh, the norm of v2 squared, which coincidentally is also 5. Um, this gets multiplied to the vector v2, which is negative 1, 0, 2, okay? Simplifying this down, this 
um, dot product right here, I'm going to get negative 2 plus 0 plus 0. So that becomes negative 2 over 5, or negative 2 fifths. Minus negative 2 fifths, I'm just going to write that as plus 2 fifths. 2, 0, 1. Um, here, if I do this dot product, negative 1 times negative 1 is positive 1, and then I get a 0 and a 0. So this becomes minus 1 fifth times that vector, negative 1, 0, 2. Okay? Then at the end of all this, um, if you compute all of that, we end up with 0, 1, 0. Okay? So I have my three vectors one here, one here, and one here. And this is going to make the orthogonal basis uh, 2, 0, 1, negative 1, 0, 2, 0, 1, 0. And it's worth, at this step, verifying that this is, in fact, an orthogonal basis by taking dot products of corresponding, or of pairs of vectors in here and showing that all of the dot products end up being equal to zero, which they, they do. Um, as a final step, we need to normalize every vector in this set so that we have not just an orthogonal basis, but an orthonormal basis. Now, um, we uh, this, this vector right here we can pretty clearly see is already a unit vector, so there's no real need to uh, convert this to anything. It's just going to stay the same. But each of these vectors, we know that they're, the square of their norms is 5. We found that earlier, and we use that information here and here. Um, what I need to do is divide by the norms, which would be root 5. So each of these are going to be divided by root 5, giving me this orthonormal basis. 2 over root 5, 0, 1 over root 5, uh, negative 1 over root 5, 0, 2 over root 5, and then finally 0, 1, 0. That's our ortho orthonormal basis right there. Okay? All right. One last example. You'll notice that even though we've been talking about general inner product spaces this whole time, um, we've really been doing all of our examples in R3, so we want to do at least one example in um, some other type of uh, inner product space. Now this is an example that's actually worked out in your book, and I'm doing it here because it leads to an important concept in other areas of math um, called Legendre poly polynomials. So um, we're going to be working in the inner product space P2, but we're going to define this inner product on it. Now this inner product looks like the one that we defined on uh, the space of continuous functions on the interval negative 1 to 1. But remember, P2 is just a subspace of that, that vector space. So it does make sense to define this inner product on, on a uh, vector space of polynomials. Um, so with that said, what we want to do is convert the standard basis for P2 into an orthogonal basis uh, relative to this inner product. Now, the standard basis would have u1 equal to 1, u2 equal to x, and u3 equal to x squared. This is the standard basis for p2 that we've, we've talked about before. But if you checked, uh, you would see that it's actually not an orthogonal set in this inner product. So uh, we have to do something about that. Um, the Gram-Schmidt process will turn this into an orthogonal basis. So in order to use the Gram-Schmidt process, what we need to do is compute all of those um, inner products that we're going to need. Notice the very first thing that we're going to do is set v1 equal to u1, which is just the number 1. Okay. But once we get to the point where we're doing v2, remember, we're looking at uh, u2, which is x, minus the inner product of u2, again that's x, with v1, which is 1, divided by the norm squared of v1. And we multiply that to v1, which is the, uh, the vector or the polynomial 1. 
Now this, that's a one right there. I can see that may look a little bit confusing. We have to remember that these these values here are, are evaluated relative to this inner product. So let's think about this for a moment. Off to the side, or actually maybe, yeah, I'll do this off to the side. No, I'll do this down here. Um, the inner product of x with 1 is equal to this, the uh, integral from negative 1 to 1 of uh, x times 1, which is just x, dx. Now, x is an odd function, and this is a, an interval symmetric about 0, and so this will be equal to 0. Okay, So the nice thing about that is that this inner product right here is equal to 0, which means it doesn't matter what the norm of 1 is. It's automatically going to make this coefficient 0, which makes this term 0. The whole thing just goes to zero, x minus 0, which is x. So basically what this is doing is it's, it's saying that the first two vectors in this basis were orthogonal. But this is still not an orthogonal set because we don't get orthogonality once we include this third vector. Um, but the nice thing is that v2 got, got to be the same thing as u2 in this case. Now we need v3. Well, v3 is equal to u3, which is x squared, um, minus u3, the inner product of u3, which again, that's x squared, um, with v1, which is 1, over the magnitude of 1 squared times 1 minus the inner product of u3, that's x squared, with, u, uh, with v2, which is x, over the magnitude of, or the norm of x squared, and that gets multiplied to v2, which was x. Okay, so let's come down here. We need this inner product, x squared, and 1, which is the inner integral from negative 1 to 1 of x squared times 1, or just x squared, uh, dx, okay? Um, this would be equal to 2 thirds if you evaluate that integral. Okay, so this time we don't get a 0 there. I'm also going to need the inner product uh, x squared x. That's going to show up in that process. Now this is equal to the integral from negative 1 to 1 of x squared times x, which is x cubed. Um, as was the case up here, x cubed is an odd function. And this is an interval symmetric about 0, so this one actually will be 0. So it turns out that u2 and u3, the second and third vectors in our basis, were also orthogonal to each other. The only pair of vectors in the original basis that weren't orthogonal were 1 and x squared. So coming back up here now, actually, sorry, we have one more thing that we need to do. We do need to find the uh, norm of 1 squared. Remember, the purpose of this square is just to eliminate the square root. This is the same thing as the inner product of 1 with itself, which is going to equal the integral from negative 1 to 1 of 1 times 1, which is 1 dx. This would equal 2. Okay, so coming up here, we've done some work now. So this is x squared minus... This inner product right here we evaluated and we got two thirds. This norm we just found, that was two, and that's gonna be multiplied to one. Uh, this inner product was zero, and so this whole, this whole term here is gonna to go to zero. What we end up with now is uh, x squared minus one third. Okay. Um, <coughs> so, uh, well, I, you know, I want to make sure I made, did this correctly. Oh, no, no, that's fine. That's correct. Um, so this here, this here, and this here form our, uh, our three basis vectors if we wanted this to be an orthogonal basis. So if I wanted to put these all into one set, I could write this as one x, x squared, minus one-third.
Okay, so there's an example of using the Gram-Schmidt process in something other than Rn for some n. Okay, one last thing to cover in this section before we're done with chapter six. Uh, and we're not going to prove this because it's, it's easy to talk through why this is the case. Um, so if W is a finite dimensional inner product space, then we get these two, these two facts. A, if every orthogonal set in W can be extended to an orthogonal basis for W. And that's, that's assuming it's not already a basis. Um, every orthogonal set in W can, or sorry, um, oh, you know, typos, this is the same thing stated twice. It should say orthonormal, orthonormal. Let's fix that, orthonormal. Every orthonormal set in W can be extended to an orthonormal basis for W. So basically what this means, let's suppose that W is an R-dimensional, or let's make it an N-dimensional inner product space. Suppose you have a set, it's an orthogonal set, with less than N vectors in it. Um, and they're all vectors from W. Because it doesn't have enough vectors to be a basis for W, um, but it is still an orthogonal set. We know from, uh, first of all, but the fact that it's orthogonal means it's linearly independent. So that's from the first theorem we talked about in this section. And we saw back in chapter four that if you have a linearly independent set in a vector space and it's not already a basis for that vector space, you can uh, use that plus minus theorem that we talked about way back then to extend that linear, uh, linearly independent set to a basis. What that means is there's you can find vectors that you can put into that set um, until you end up with a basis. So what this is saying is if you have a set that's orthogonal, you can extend that orthogonal set to an orthogonal basis for W. And the idea is that if the set is orthogonal, it's linearly independent. Because it's linearly independent, that set can be extended to a basis for W. Now the, the set may not be a base, may not be orthogonal right away because the new vectors that you put in there may not be orthogonal to you know, all the other vectors. However, simply by extending this set to a basis for W means that you can now apply the Gram-Schmidt process to that basis and make it orthogonal, giving you what we we're looking at here. Similar similar reasoning shows part B as well. Okay, um, so that's actually it for chapter six, and that's it for this video.